Hey there, this is Mr. Icarus, and welcome to yet another edition of Doom Mod Madness. Now, just because Spooky Month is officially over, doesn't mean that the spookiness has to go away, and that's why this time around we are checking out a mod by the name of Splatterhouse 3D. Now, for those of you not in the know, Splatterhouse 3D is in fact based off of Splatterhouse, a side-scrolling beat-em-up originally released in 1988. And quite possibly one of my favorite things about it is when it was ported to the TurboGrafx-16, it had a parental advisory warning that stated the horrifying theme of this game may be inappropriate for young children and cowards. But much like the original Splatterhouse, Splatterhouse 3D puts you in the tattered clothing of Rick, our masked protagonist with an uncanny resemblance to Jason Voorhees of Friday the 13th fame. But the mask here is not just for show, it's in fact an ancient artifact known as the Terror Mask, one that bestows its wearer with unrivaled strength and an unmistakable bloodlust. But rather than hunting down a gaggle of idiotic teenagers, this time you're fighting through a legion of ghouls and abominations, all in search of Rick's beloved Jenny, who has incidentally been kidnapped by the evil scientist Dr. West. As you might imagine, the combat in Splatterhouse 3D has a strong focus on the up close and personal, what with the majority of your weapons being melee based. To begin with, you'll have nothing but your fists and a mighty foot, but it's not very long before you pick up the good old bloody baseball bat. Now, considering most basic enemies go down in one or two hits with either weapon, you may be wondering what the point of choosing between them actually is, but as it turns out, the baseball bat is actually rather effective for knocking certain enemies back a few paces, and with tougher enemies such as this one here, it's vital to keep a little bit of maneuvering room between yourself and it. That said, it's not always a guaranteed effect of using this particular weapon, so after a while you will develop a sort of rhythm to your attacks where you'll go in for the hit and then back off a few paces to avoid any potential melee counter-attacks. And that is certainly a good habit to get into, especially with certain enemies such as the Bagman here, which have devastating up-close attacks, what with those dual chainsaws. As previously witnessed, you'll also have projectile vomiting enemies to deal with, which again, will make sure your dodging game is very much on point. For those of you hoping for a more ranged method of dispatching your enemies, the Super Shotgun does indeed make an appearance here, though it's probably best saved for encounters with tougher enemies, because the ammunition tends to be in fairly short supply. The chainsaw, however, never runs out of fuel, which means you can thoroughly eviscerate your enemies all to your heart's content. In fact, it actually comes quite in handy when dealing with certain particular enemy types, such as the zombie, which if you merely punch it, hit it over the head, or shoot it with the shotgun, it will actually manage to resurrect after a short period of time. But when it's in pieces and covering the ceiling, floor, and walls, there's not much chance for that to happen anymore. The weapons we've seen so far essentially make up the lion's share of what you'll be using for the majority of Splatterhouse 3D. But one thing I feel that this mod actually does quite well is giving you a good excuse to actually switch between them on a fairly regular basis. There's the aforementioned shortage of shotgun shells, meaning you should ideally ration them for the enemies that truly require it. And believe it or not, there are situations where the chainsaw isn't always the best possible tool for the job. Sure, it can stun lock certain enemies while you're carving them into itty bitty pieces, but certain enemies can also use that closeness to inflict quite hefty damage in kind. It's these kind of elements that help to ensure that the core combat doesn't get too repetitive. There's always some combination of monsters that will require you to switch up what you're doing ever so slightly. And of course, there are the other entries in the Splatterhouse 3D armory, such as the explosive flasks, which I tend to exclusively reserve for the tankier enemies or even boss encounters. They're certainly not that well suited for close quarters combat, especially in confined situations such as this one, and if you know anything about me and my relationship with explosives, you'll know how that typically tends to turn out. 
So how about the levels that you'll find yourself playing through during the course of Splatterhouse 3D? Well, thankfully, one of the first things you'll find is that they are nowhere near as linear as the side-scrolling beat-em-up origins may suggest. In fact, you've got some relatively nice constructed levels here that don't ever feel like they get too convoluted. Another interesting thing that you'll probably discover about the levels is the lack of music playing over the top of them. Now, I can't entirely be sure whether this is an error on my part or something that is entirely intentional, but I do find that it lends a certain something to the atmosphere of the levels themselves. It makes for an interesting difference to be sure, rather than relying on an overt musical track, you instead get more emphasis on the ambient noises that are present within the level itself, be it the drone of sinister tech, the pitter patter of rain outside, or the horrifying howls, cries and groans of enemies that you've yet to encounter. The pacing of Splatterhouse 3D, at least during the course of its first episode, is also very much on point. It takes place over the course of six levels, and it does a really good job of just gradually introducing you to new elements as you make your way through them. In particular, I was a fan of how it introduced new enemy types quite frequently in the form of mini-boss encounters at the end of certain levels, which gave me ample opportunity to figure out what this new enemy was all about before it's reintroduced in more frequent encounters further on down the line. This kind of gradual introduction is also applicable in a sense to the more stylistic elements of Splatterhouse 3D. Even though I'm currently fighting through a level of just fleshy nightmares right now, it's not something that's inflicted on you out of the blue. It's something that's hinted at, that's suggested as you make your way through preceding levels. So there's a nice sense of continuity as you go from one to the next, and that's something I always greatly appreciate. So with regards to episode 1 of Splatterhouse 3D, I can pretty safely say that I've had a nicely enjoyable time with this one. It certainly exceeded my initial expectations. I was worried that it was going to get a little repetitive with the focus on melee, but as I've already explained, there are elements at play here that ensure it stays interesting. I'm also a fan of how this mod encourages aggressive gameplay, and one method which it employs in order to do that is how it treats health. You'll notice that during the course of these levels there is a distinct lack of pre-existing med packs. In fact, all, if not most, of the health that you acquire during the course of this is done through carving up your enemies and taking it from their corpses. So, up until this point, we've largely focused on Episode 1 of Splatterhouse 3D, but now it's time to turn our attention to Episode 2, and I'm going to try my best to try and figure out why exactly I didn't enjoy this part as much as I would have liked to. I suppose one of the first things I could put my finger on is the addition of a new enemy, which is this one right here in glorious lobster red, and occasionally when you kill it, a boar worm will sprout from its corpse, and these things quickly became one of my least favorite things to deal with. I mean, if we're going to get down to brass tacks, one of the first things you'll discover is that they're pretty tricky to hit, considering their size, and by the time you've actually spotted that they're down there, especially in more hectic scenarios, they'll be well within leaping distance, and these little buggers have a pretty significant leap, and once they chomp on your face, you'll find that the amount of damage they can inflict is pretty goddamn significant. So, all of this together, including my unfortunate condition regarding exploding flasks, meant that that episode 2 got off to a fairly noticeably difficult start. So, the second level, Elevator. This one pretty much immediately rubbed me the wrong way because it all revolves around a guess what? Elevator that automatically goes up and down, and you have to pretty much figure out what level you need to get off at first in order to progress, which, yeah, first time round, you're not gonna have a clue. It's just tremendously disorientating to deal with, and if you do suddenly decide that, oh no, you do need to be one level up, you'll turn around and find that elevator is going to have to slowly ascend all the way back to the top, and then all the way back down to the bottom before you can get back on the thing. So yeah, wasn't a fan of that. Was a fan of this guy though. This is a pre-existing enemy from episode 1, but this behavior where he actively blocks you from getting anywhere near him, that's something I hadn't seen before. Couldn't tell you whether it's episode 2 exclusive or whether I just didn't have the right conditions to trigger it, but that, that's pretty goddamn neat. 
So yeah, hell of a it took entirely too goddamn long to get through, thanks to the way it was structured. And then you get into level 3, which has one of the biggest difficulty spikes of the episode, in my opinion, because you get into this room and you have an honestly pretty fun sequence where you're just carving through these just grim little abominations, covering the walls in blood, watching them explode with guts and gore everywhere. Particularly a fan of those effects, by the way. But all the while, it is whittling your health down. I mean, sure, they do drop health, but it's not quite enough because once you're done with all of these little buggers, it eventually transitions into a fight with the Bagman. You remember the Bagman, right? He has two chainsaws. And in a chainsaw versus chainsaw scenario, he's gonna win. I'm serious though when I say this took me about five goddamn tries to actually get through. So I eventually get through that section. I feel like the nightmare's over. I'm still kind of nursing my health. And then guess what, Bagman? You love Bagman, right? Everyone loves Bagman. Let's sing the Bagman theme tune. Na 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 Bagman. Na 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 Bagman. 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 <laughs> So, at this point, I think I've pretty much cracked what my issue is with episode 2. On one front, the levels are certainly more convoluted than what you'd find during the course of episode 1. There are a lot of situations here where I did just flat out get lost for extended periods of time. And then, once I've figured out where I'm going, the game then flat out assaults me with these downright cruel encounters. What I'm really trying to say here is that episode 2 of Splathouse 3D is a big fat meanie doo-doo head and uh, I, I was probably too exhausted and tired by the time I'd finished with episode 1 to even contemplate dealing with episode 2. I just didn't quite know it yet. Now, feel free to correct me on this one, but I'm pretty sure the ethereal godlike entities I'm currently fighting against here are not only possessed of a very comical walking animation, but they also appear to be wearing boxer shorts. No particular point to this uh, observation, I just thought it was an aspect of Splatterhouse 3D that everyone should know about. You just can't unsee it now, can you? I should probably mention the whole thing about being able to fly during this section as well. It is a legitimate part of episode 2. I didn't crack under pressure and activate some strange cheat. This is meant to happen, and once you're done fighting the Boxer Brigade here, you have to find a way out, which is more difficult than it sounds, because this section really does just happen to you, and the change to a uh, mostly monochromatic color scheme here actually makes identifying the ways you're supposed to go pretty difficult. You're supposed to find these portals, you'll fly down into them, fight some other stuff, fl fly through various other things, and eventually find your way out. And again, much like Elevator, you don't have much of a clue to go on first time round. It's going to take a fair bit of derping, and when you're dealing with an endgame situation such as this, I don't know about you, but I'd much rather be getting on with it rather than have any opportunity to stand still and scratch my head. So you know what, I think I've drilled down into the essence of what it is that doesn't quite work for me about episode 2 in comparison to episode 1. I've got to be crystal clear though, I'm not saying that episode 2 is bad, it's just not as good in my estimation. And there are a lot of mitigating factors, there's plenty of things that will be affecting my judgement on that front. First of which being that I was already kind of exhausted from playing through the first episode, which you should absolutely do, and you know what? Maybe have a nice cup of tea afterwards, and have a rest, and a nice a nice snooze maybe. Then come back the next day and give episode 2 a try. But make sure you grit those teeth, because it is a much more meaty challenge in comparison. I still stand by my assessment, however, that some of the levels of episode 2 are a tad more convoluted than they actually need be, and end up robbing some of those levels of the forward momentum of that gore-drenched action that you're trying to engage in, that push-forward, harvest-your-enemies of the life-force type of action that should be what this is all about, but ends up getting quite literally a little lost sometimes. 
Now, naturally, I haven't covered this thoroughly from top to bottom. There's a few boss battles, there's a few encounters that I'd rather leave under wraps for you to experience for yourself. And ultimately, I indeed hope that you do so, because despite my misgivings, I'd say Splatterhouse 3D is a pretty damn solid experience. And if you're interested in giving it a will for yourself, then you'll find the link, as usual, in the description below. While I'm at it, I'd like to give a great big thank you to my wonderful patrons over on Patreon. Thank you so very much for supporting the channel and for helping to make content like this possible. If you're interested in lending a hand yourself, maybe you'd like to see your name on screen, or maybe you'd like to gain access to early editions of my videos before anyone else. Well, if that's the case, you'll find the link to my Patreon page also in the description below. Hopefully you've enjoyed this video, feel free to let me know what you thought in the comments, and feel free to suggest any mods you'd like to see me cover in future episodes of Doom Mod Madness. This has been Mr. Icarus, thank you very much for watching. Icarus out.